So thank you guys so much for coming out on a rainy day and we have such a full crowd to listen to me talk about um, the garden landscape in cross-cultural translation, China and the West. Um, and I'm using translation here a little bit loosely. I kind of think about it spatially and mathematically that we're going to translate to move from China into a different space um, along with translation of, of ideas. Um, so before we kind of jump to Chinoiserie in the West, I'd actually like to begin with a classical Chinese garden, the Lion Grove Garden in Suzhou, which I had the pleasure of actually visiting myself this summer, so that we can get an idea, oh, so that we can get an idea of um, what are the principles of classical Chinese gardens, such as this painting we see here, uh, attributed to the Yuan master Ni Zan, um, although the Palace Museum thinks this is probably a later Ming Dynasty copy. And we can see this garden being presented as a bit of a rustic retreat, even though it is located within the city. We have a small pavilion, so we enter, okay. So we sort of enter through here, and then as you proceed to the back, there's a small pavilion that's set within a rockery feature. And within kind of the visual rhetoric of this painting, it's, it plays with the idea of perhaps this is actually an actual mountain in the wilderness, um, or is it an artificial rockery in a garden space? And so one of the themes we'll be exploring through this talk is this slippage, this conflation between garden, a bounded off domesticated space, and a larger, wilder landscape that's not bounded by walls. Um, so as you can see from the many seals and writing on this painting, it was in the collection of our favorite emperor, the Qianlong Emperor, um, who left many traces of himself in writing and seals upon the painting, but he also personally visited the garden many times, five times between 1757 and 17. 84, um, at which point he also had his court artists make a record of it in woodblock print format. Um, when he went to go see it, the garden was largely in disrepair, so this is actually a reconstruction, a restoration of the garden um, when he went to go visit. And we can see in this woodblock that it's quite clear that this is a garden space. It is walled off. Uh, we can see that the pond is actually squared with these fantastic rocks, Lake Tai rocks, that create an impression of artificial mountains or the form of clouds or the form of leaping lions, to like, use your imagination. Um, so we're going to go to jump to the garden as, as it appears to us today. So this is the current floor plan, and you can see that in layout, it coordinates between kind of axial symmetry along where the, the buildings are, along with a lot of irregularity in the boundaries, the borders of the water features and in how you would move through it. So let's just um, come take a walk with me and we'll, we'll walk through this. As you enter, your site is actually immediately blocked by a marble slab. So we have this one principle of concealing, that you're never going to see all the way down through a site. Um, and then, and so that's this part right here as you enter, so you're not sure like what's in the courtyard beyond. And then as you make your way through, we're going to come upon a moon gate. So the shape of the gate frames your view um, and kind of teases you as to what is going to lie beyond, right? So your, your curiosity is piqued. You wanna see what's on the other side. So as we continue to walk through, we're gonna go up to this space here where there is a nine lion peak. So supposedly this rock feature looks like pouncing lions. Um, you have to really use your imagination. Um, it's about 70% you know, imagination and 30% form. And so we're gonna continue to go through here, we're gonna come down to this space, and so this becomes the 
the pivot the pivot point between the architecture of the residential spaces and the, the garden itself. So we're gonna walk across this bridge and we're gonna enter this piled up mountain of rocks and really enter into a labyrinth where we're not really sure where we're going, but we're constantly being teased by glimpses of what lies beyond. And so we're going to, as we're wandering through this rockery, we're gonna come across this building that's set right in the middle, set low actually. So, and it's called the Dwelling Among Clouds. So this is one example of how the, the naming of sites is an important feature of Chinese garden spaces, that everything has a name. And the name helps, is very evocative. And so you can kind of imagine that this building set here is surrounded by, it's surrounded by rocks, but the rocks also resemble the amorphous forms of clouds all around. So we're gonna come through and we're gonna oops, see it from, see this whole feature from the other side. I quite like this photo taken in the summer where with the lotus all in, in bloom and you can't see the edge of the shore so it almost looks like people who are walking through here are kind of floating in an immortal realm between wonderful flowers and a heavenly realm of clouds and mist. So we're going to come to this walk, we're gonna walk through here, we're gonna to come to this pavilion that's set in the middle of the water along a zigzag path. And what I really like about this is that it's a site that engages mul multiple senses. Because you're going to come, you're gonna walk zigzagging through to this pavilion, and as you get to the pavilion, you see framed against its columns another rockery on the other side. But you're going to look up, and there's a plaque here that says, beholding the waterfall but your eyes looking ahead don't see a waterfall, but your ears on the other hand hear the sound of water falling. But what you have to do is you have to turn around looking back the way you came to see that hidden away in the corner is a tiny waterfall. And then, you're in, and then you have a decision to make, which way are you gonna go forward or back? So, um, we come to, this is the pavilion that is really marking that the Qianlo Emperor was here. You can see it in the use of the gold ornamentation that you don't see elsewhere in the garden and in the traces of his own words that when he came here he said, this place is truly delightful and that is emblazoned upon the plaque. So that is located here in the garden space. And finally, um, we come to this stone boat. And I want to make a note that this is actually a fairly recent addition to the space. This was added around 1917 to 1926. Um, in 1917, the grand uncle of American architect I.M. Pei had purchased the garden and did this vast restoration where he added the stone boat feature and put in a lot of colored glass all through um, the garden. And so I.M. Pei spent many of his younger when he was young, he spent many of his summers here playing around the site. Um, which, and, and if we have time, we'll see how that in, impacted his later work. Um, so, we've sort of seen what are the principal features of what would be considered a classical Chinese garden. But the Europeans of the 17th and 18th century would not have seen this because they weren't allowed to come into this space. How would they have encountered the idea of what a Chinese garden could be. And as you learned last week um, with Stacy, that most of their encounters with China are through, haha, China. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank, thank, thanks for laughing. <laughs> <laughs> through these material export goods that are making their ways to their shores, such as this crackware plate that is in the Asian Art Museum. Um, where we see a kind of fragmented piece of a Chinese, of a landscape, tiny landscape, with ducks and oversized lotuses. Um, and you also saw this last week as well, um, the interior of a Chinese shop, um, a 
that, that Stacy also showed you last week with um, you know, many images, fragmented images of nature, animals, plants, what would have been thought of as a Chinese landscape on, on these export goods. So, um, some of the first images of China that would have been encountered uh, in print from someone who actually went to China is Neuhoff's publication in Embassy from the East India Company of the United Provinces to the Grand Chartered Com Emperor of China, uh, published in 1665. And so Neuhoff actually did have the opportunity to see the Chinese landscape and he brought but his images that he brought back are, are rather a bit fantastical and really contributed to the idea that um, one of the key features of Chinese gardens are these rockeries that is quite exaggerated in his print image here where um, the rockeries are now hundreds and hundreds of feet high and people, tiny minuscule people can pass through them and wander around them and go up this weird staircase to, to nowhere. Um, so this idea that uh, of, a, of a fantastical landscape, almost. Um, so the English um, essayist, Sir William Temple, um, amidst all of this interest in China, he publishes one of the very, very key works that would be influential in how the idea of the Chinese garden makes its way into the English landscape garden. And he wrote, quote, among us, the beauty of building and planting is placed chiefly in some certain proportions, symmetries, or uniformities. Our walks and trees range so as to answer on another and at exact distances. The Chinese scorn this way of planting and say a boy that can tell a hundred may plant walks of trees in straight lines and over against one another and to what length and extent he pleases. But their greatest reach of imagination is employed in contriving figures where the beauty shall be great and strike the eye, but without any order or disposition of parts. And though we have hardly any notion of this sort of beauty, yet they have a particular word to express it. And this word that he, I, it's not clear where he's getting the origin of this word, but he calls it sharwagdi. And this term is then picked up and used by many of the European garden designers to really mean um, an idea that they're attributing to China, but meaning irregularity, um, lack of geometric precision, and the aesthetic of naturalness. So, you know, he had never actually seen a Chinese garden, but he had seen the temples, bridges, and pagodas on export goods, so perhaps that's where, temp where Sir William Temple is getting the idea of irregularity from. The first images of actual Chinese gardens were coming from the Jesuits that were working with the Qing emperors. And so these Jesuits were primarily exposed to the vast garden palaces, such as the mountain hamlet for escaping heat, um, which is shown here by court artist Lung Mei, situated up in Chenda, which is about a um, three hour bus ride from, from the center of Beijing shown here, and you can see it is a, an empire in microcosm where we have a palace structure in the front and what extends out into the lake. So this is the lake region that is an imitation of these, of sort of Suzhou type gardens, a vast uh, 10,000 tree covered plain in the back and then mountain regions all around. Um, have you guys seen this? Did Pat show you guys this before? No? Okay, just wondering. Um, it's one of, one of our favorite paintings. <laughs> um, here's a, a detail of that lake region where you can see the island's actually laid out a little bit like it's a, a lingzhi fungus, so kind of an iconography of uh, immortality laid out upon the lake. So the Kangxi Emperor designated 36 scenes and had them carved into woodblock form to to be preserved. And his court artist, Matteo Ripa, he was commissioned at the same time to do a copper plate 
version, which was completed in 1714. Uh, if we do a side-by-side -side comparison, we can see that it's a relatively faithful adaptation with the exception of some additional shading and textural features in the water and in the sky, as well as Mateo Ripas actually transformed some of the, the trees into other types of trees. So this one here has now become a, a willow. When Ripa returned to England in 1724, he brought back a few of this, these copper-plated sets, um, and these were acquired by patrons who later had ties to the development of the English-Chinese garden, um, such as the Earl of Burlington, who was the patron of William Kent. Um, overall, however, most people in England probably didn't see the Ripa prints. However, in 1753, they, his prints are reinterpreted and published as the emperor of China's palace and his principal gardens. Uh, and we can see here that it's quite a bit different than the print you just saw. And if, again, if we compare them side by side, we can see that quite a few additions have been made to appeal to the public. So this uninhabited landscape suddenly is filled with boats and little figures carrying fishing sticks and walking along the shore, um, and it's suddenly a scene full of activity. And we can see that the publisher has, in, in a way, done a translation. He's translated the unfamiliar um, landscape into what actually Stacey Sloboda has said as the visual language of chinoiserie. So the, the boats and figures you would have seen in lacquer and porcelain have now made their way onto a print of a Chinese garden. One of the most famous accounts of a Chinese garden is written by Jean-Denis Attre. He was a Jesuit who was working in the court of the Qianlong Emperor and was working in the Yue Mingyuan, uh, in the Garden of Perfect Brightness. And this might be one of the most influential texts um, that made its way back, and it was translated into multiple languages and published many times and quoted by many of the leading garden designers of the time. And so let's just look at some of the, how he describes some of it, you know. Um, they go from one of the valleys to another, not by formal straight walks as in Europe, but by various turnings and windings adorned on the sides with little pavilions and charming grottos. Pieces of rock are placed with so much art that you would take it to be the work of nature. In some parts, the water is wide, in others narrow. Here it serpentizes and there spreads away. In their pleasure houses, they rather choose a beautiful disorder and a wandering as far as possible from all the rules of art. All is in good taste and so managed that its beauties appear gradually, one after another. To enjoy them as one ought, you should view every piece by itself. So here he's starting to present some of the principles of what he he is seeing as a, a Chinese garden um, to a European audience that, one, we're not doing straight lines, everything is curving, and there's a lot of variety um, that you, your water features can be wide and calm or small and tumbling. Um, and so let's actually look at the Yue Mingyuan for a little bit. And I won't show you all 40 scenes or else we'll be here forever. Um, but this is from a painting album that was commissioned in 1744. We'll begin right at the entrance with the main audience hall, and this is where the emperor would have received foreign dignitaries to do business. Um, so the garden is functioning in some ways a lot like Versailles functioned for Louis XIV, where it's a site of administration, but it's also a site of leisure and pleasure. And as a whole landscape, it really showcased the extent of imperial power and control. So we'll move up from it, from the main entrance to this area of nine islands, and in the naming of the site, you can see how it's evoking the very form that it takes of nine continents clear and calm with the imperial residences here and many other pavilions set along the shores of all of these 
islands here. Um, within this garden, we also have expressions of um, kind of the emperor's aspirations for the realm so that it would be peaceful and harmonious as seen in the shaped buildings. So this is a fun one, shaped like a swastika. And then another shaped building that is in the shape of the, of the field character to um, promote the idea of agricultural wellness throughout the realm. So, so you can see that the garden is operating, the, as Atere would have experienced this garden, he's keeping in mind that how different it is from the gardens that he knows in Europe. And so the great foil to all of this is, of course, the garden at Versailles, as shown here, where everything is regulated um, with very clear axial views down from the palace, across the basin, across the Grand Canal, um, very regular groves of trees, um, and everything is laid out in extremely strict geometric precision. All the lines are straight. So while um, Europe is grappling with this idea of the Chinese garden, at the same time, um, as, well, they're, as they're grappling with the idea of the Chinese garden in contrast to Versailles, of course, the Qianlong Emperor himself is also being exposed to what a European garden looks like. And he's seeing the images of Versailles or gardens like it with their vast fountains. And so actually in the Yuan Mingyuan itself, there is a small section of European palaces that is laid out like a tiny Baroque garden. Um, around the, 17, the 1740s, um, Qianlong tells his Jesuits, you know, I quite like these fountains that I'm seeing in these images you've brought back, so I want something similar. Make me a European garden. And so we have this a corner of the, of the Yuan Mingyuan that is dedicated to European palaces. And I'm just gonna show you a few prints from that. So there is a garden maze built out of brick and the emperor would sit up here and watch his court ladies try to navigate their way around. <laughs> And of course, he can see if they're taking a wrong turn, but they can't. Um, and I can say it's actually, it's, it's not an easy maze to solve. This has been reconstructed in the Yuan Mingyuan Ruins Park in Beijing. And it's quite a devil to get through, I have to say. And you see, sometimes you'll see tourists give up and they'll just climb over the walls to get out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we'll come, so that was the maze here. And then if we come here, we'll come to the, the largest and perhaps most famous building on the site, the Hall of Calm Seas. Um, so called because behind it was actually a, a giant water tank that supplied water to the, the fountains. Um, so you can see in front of it, there is a giant clam shell from which water would pour out. And water is also coming out of um, sculptures at the top and kind of tripping down the steps on either side. And most famously, it's known for a set of uh, zodiac animals that are arranged on either end. And this was also a water clock. So each animal would spout water um, every two hours. And at noon, all 12 of them would, would spout. Um, they're, of course, most famous now for um, the bronze animal heads that come up onto auction and have now, I think all of the ones that have come onto auction have now been repatriated to China, but they're always quite controversial when they, when they show up. Um, but again, actual images of the Yuan Mingyuan wouldn't be disseminated in Europe until the 1780s. So in the meantime, what's happening in England? 
and we're, we're gonna take a look at Stowe. So this is the plan of Stowe Garden in Buckinghamshire in 1733. It was the estate of the Temple Grenvilles. Um, and as we can see from this ground plan, one of the earlier plans, it does actually follow the formal logic we were seeing at Versailles. But in 1738 or thereabouts, there is a Chinese house that is going to be placed right there in between Hawkwell Field and the Elysian Fields. So what is it doing there? So this is, we're gonna take a look at this. Um, it was originally situated on stilts over a small pond. So if we go back, we can see it's located, it was actually located over water. Um, possibly designed by the landscape architect William Kent, um, who was commissioned at this period to actually transform Stowe from, a, from the formal garden into a English landscape garden where all the straight lines have been made serpentine and the shore, shorelines of the lake have all been transformed into the image of, of nature. Um, so we have here a square wooden building with latticed windows, painted with chinoiserie panels, a lead roof, and gilt dragon finials. Inside it, according to written records of the time, there was a statue of a sleeping Chinese lady. And um, in the pond next to it, there were little decoy ducks that bobbed around. And you would have approached this when it was still over water um, by a bridge that had porcelain vases placed on either side of it. So how do we interpret this? It's possible that, and there's many interpretations, and I think it's the abundance of the multiplicity of interpretations that makes it interesting, is that um, we could say that this Chinese house is representing Confucian political order and social harmony, the idea of China as a meritocracy, um, as something to be emulated. It's um, possible that it is positioned here in the garden as a symbol for the commercial wealth that China offered um, as a representative of, as an architectural representative of all the material goods that were being brought back. Um, it could also be interpreted as a space for feminine diversions, an erotic space where um, women go to sleep and have fun in the garden. <laughs> um, we can also look at its location, and it would have been located around here, where it's in a, in a physical conversation with all of the other monuments that are around it. So placed between the Elysian fields where there's a temple of ancient virtue, a temple of British worthies, um, placed next to Hawkwell Park where there's a temple to the Saxon deities, a Gothic temple, a temple of friendship. So we're having these kind of themed areas of the park that are monuments to the classical past as well as monuments to native British roots. So when it's situated here then, the the situation of China within the garden kind of pivots and mediates between these two ideas for the British present. That, um, that China as an ancient civilization can be comparable to the past glories of Rome and Greece, um, but also is being a source of wealth for contemporary uh, British aristocrats. Um, so the Chinese house, as we see it today, this is actually a restored version. In, in 1751, it was actually put into storage, and then it was moved in 1758 to another estate. It made its way to Ireland for a little bit, and finally the National Trust bought it in 1990 and reinstalled it back at Stowe. So the way we're seeing it now is actually not how it would have um, been located when it was first installed. 
So we can see that as um, China is being expressed in European garden spaces, it's never copied wholesale. It's expressed as one part of a larger landscape ensemble. It shares the space with the ruin, with classical ruins, with Gothic ruins, um, with neoclassical temples, Gothic cathedrals, and. So a lot of prior scholarship has just said this is just eclecticism in the 18th century. They just wanted everything, and so they just threw it all into the landscape. Um, but as we're reading these spaces, we can see that um, there is a, a sort of logic to the madness of it all. So um, we'll, we'll look at one more example. To, uh, the, we'll look at an estate that has a closer connection to Asia and to China. And we're gonna go to Shugborough in Staffordshire. So this, this also had a Chinese house, and it, this Shugborough was the estate of Thomas Anson. Um, Thomas Anson, the older brother of George Anson, shown here. Thomas um, inherited this from his father. He was a founding member of the Society of Dilettanti for appreciation. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> for appreciation of classical Greek art. So Thomas had toured the entire Mediterranean in 1740 and was intensely interested in the monuments of the classical past. His younger brother is more famous though. George had joined the Royal Navy. And in 1740 to 1744, when England was at war with Spain, he pursued the Spanish fleet um, around the world. He sailed around South America. Um, he nearly met with disaster a few times, but fortunately Canton was there as a port of, of refuge. Um, and while circumnavigating the globe and chasing Spanish ships, he captured a few Spanish galleons. And so when he returned to England in 1744, he was loaded down with all of this American silver that he had captured from Spain. So while George never formally owned Shugborough, um, he was quite his wealth and his status was very influential in its creation. So before we look at the garden, we can actually look at a piece of porcelain, the famous Anson plate which um, supposedly was gifted by grateful European merchants in Canton after Anson and his crew helped put out a fire. Um, and this was a, a dinner service that was, would also have been made and commissioned um, in Canton by the uh, enamelers there. So we have at the bottom the Anson crest um, as well as the griffin, the coat of arms and the griffin crest and in the center, a garlanded breadfruit tree. So we have um, a, a plant that is from, an exotic plant from um, the, the New World. Um, and emblematically, we have the absent master motif as well as the altar of love. So together, this is known as the Valentine pattern. What's most interesting to us are the panels along the rim where we have harbor scenes of the Pearl River in Canton and also the harbor in Devon, so in England. And so as you turn the plate, then we reenact the Anson's travels around the world and the source of their wealth. So the Chinese house at Shugbro uh, built around 1747, and we can see here in this watercolor by, by Moses Griffin. Um, it was also originally situated next to water with a boathouse and approached by, by two bridges onto this little island. Uh, and inside it was housed the collection of Anson's porcelain, all of the goods that he acquired in China, so reverse mirror paintings and all these other objects. Um, the, the written sources say that it's hard to see in this particular painting, um, but others who have studied this house say that it was actually painted in blue and white fret patterns. So the exterior of the house would have almost resembled the porcelain that it held inside of itself, which is kind of fun. The way we're, if you go to visit Shugborough today, 
you're seeing it um, slightly move. There was a big flood in 1795, so it actually now stands not on an island, but on a promontory uh, with a new red ironwork bridge that was added in 1813. Inside it, um, with all of the, the Chinese objects have now been removed to the main house, but inside the Chinese house, you can still see the interior decoration of um, really, really bright turquoise turquoise walls with red columns and painted red fretwork and really fun monkeys that are gambling about this Rococo landscape and they're holding kites or kites shaped like birds or birds on a string that they're walking through the landscape. Um, of course, as at Stowe, this Chinese house did not exist in isolation, but was part of a landscape ensemble. So in this painting by Nicholas Dahl, um, we're seeing not the Chinese house quite yet, but there is evidence that there was a pagoda there as well, situated on a rockery over a river. And this pagoda is, uh, in landscape conversation with these other monuments, like the triumphal arch that Thomas Anson built to commemorate his brother George, as well as other monuments that are based off of Thomas's travels around um, the Mediterranean, so a tower of the winds. And when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking of, this is interesting, this conversation between a pagoda, so China, George, who traveled the world, and a monument to the wind, something crucial to, your, to someone who's in the Navy, right? So we have actually here this triumphal journey from across the oceans, across the seas, and then back home. So one more painting of the Shugborough landscape where we can see the the west front of the house, along with the Chinese house here, and built ruins and classical temples there. So the whole landscape is a built souvenir of the travels of these two brothers, of copies of monuments seen in Athens, um, as well as um, architectural features from China. Um, and, you know, if we think about the history of this family, before George was elevated to the peerage, the Ansons, they were well-to-do, but they weren't, they weren't of particular importance in national affairs. So really, it's George's return from China with all of this wealth that has greatly expanded the family's um, status uh, in society, both monetarily and societally. So Shugborough, the entire landscape together with the Chinese house, with the Chinese pagoda, um, with these classical monuments is really a testament to their success, to how they have really established themselves as men of cosmopolitan taste and of learning. The, the craze for chinoiserie is um, kind of shown here in these pattern books that were also published. You know, if you didn't travel around the world and didn't make it to China and back, how would you have known um, or thought about what chinoiserie features were like? And so William and John Halfpenny published a few books that claim to show you how you can ornament your house or your garden in the Chinese style. And so you can see that here, there's not very much that is Chinese about, <laughs> about these buildings. If you look at the floor plan, I mean, they're your pretty standard um, English manor house. The so-called Chinese features are limited to surface ornamentation of the spurs along the edges, having dragon finials on the corners of the roofs and little pagoda-like roofs put over your windows. Um, 
But these pattern books, books were quite popular, and you know they published another one, Rural Architecture and the Chinese Taste, to help you to help um, designers kind of select you know, how to build a so-called Chinese bridge, what a Chinese pavilion looks like, always usually situated over water. Um, and so to a man like William Chambers, this was annoying. Um, William Chambers had joined the Swedish East India Company in 1740 as supercargo, and he actually sailed to Canton in 1743 and 1748, so kind of around the same time as George Anson, actually. When he returned from his travels, he trained as an architect in France and in Italy before he settled down in London in 1755, where he was appointed tutor to the prince, the, um, who would later be George III, and architect to the king. So he was a member of the Royal Academy, and he also designed for the Dowager Princess Augusta, most notably at Kew Gardens, and that was the image we saw as my title slide. Um, so he is a man who is well-versed in contemporary architecture, in classical ruins, and on China. And in 1757, he published a corrective to the halfpenny designs as part um, in his book, Designs of Chinese Buildings, Furniture, Dresses, Machines, and Utensils. There was also an essay of the art of laying out gardens among the Chinese, where he says, nature is their pattern, and their aim is to imitate her in all her beautiful irregularities. The whole ground is laid out in a variety of scenes, and you are led by winding passages cut in the groves to the different points of view, each of which is marked by a seat, a building, or some other object. He also describes three types of scenes, the pleasing, the horde, and the enchanted. Um, I'm gonna come back to that at a later slide. The Chinese artists, knowing how powerfully contrast operates on the mind, constantly practice sudden transitions and a striking opposition of forms, colors, and shades in such a manner as to render the whole composition at once distinct in its parts and striking in the whole. So he has a chance to put his theories into practice when in the early 1760s, as architect to the Dowager Princess, he was commissioned to shape the grounds at Kew in London. Um, and it's at Kew where we find the largest architectural expression of uh, China in a Western garden space that is still standing, the Great Pagoda at Kew. Um, of the three Chinese structures erected by Chambers, we, uh, the pagoda is the only one that is still standing. We also have his designs for a Chinese pavilion and a so-called House of Confucius, which he seemed rather embarrassed about later in his career because he said, oh, I, I think it was designed by a Mr. Groupie and then I moved it to this other side of the garden. Um, but his um, scholars think that, no, he, he actually designed it himself, he just didn't want to admit it later. <laughs> so we're gonna um, go on a, a short walk through, um, through Q. I'm showing this is a half, a segment of a, a general plan that was drawn up by Chambers um, a, in the 1760s as he was designing this space. He, in his published account, said that the topography of Q was actually pretty flat and super boring, so it was his job to make it interesting again by reshaping the land and putting in scenes of interest. Um, so you would enter through here, this is the palace. You'll walk past the orangery, go past a, a great stove that heated up the greenhouses behind, um, go through a, an aviary, and then here we come across the first, um, the Chinese pavilion, which is seen here in a, um, a water, in the original watercolor of, of the scene. So around it, in the shape of an oval are these cages that held um, birds that were brought back from Asia. So think like pheasants um, that are running around inside here with some birds in the big basin of the lake 
in the middle, and then in the midst of it all approached by a bridge, this pavilion. Um, yes, so um, what is interesting to me actually is that when I found this, this is an image that's currently at the Metropolitan Museum, and I had seen this only in black and white previously as a print in the publication. And it was quite surprising to me to see that the pavilion is white, um, which I wasn't expecting. Uh, but it's curious to think how the color of it in evoking the color of classical monuments such as the structure in the back here is putting China in conversation with a classical past. And behind it is, this is the temple of Bellona, uh, the goddess of war, and it, inside it is commemorating the heroes of the Seven Years' War. Uh, so we're going to continue walking and we're gonna come around. So, we're gonna, so the, that was like over here, so we're gonna come around to the other half of the garden coming around here past the, the wilderness. And at the far end, we find three exotic buildings. So we have the Great Pagoda in the center with, a, with the Alhambra here, a copy of the Alhambra, and a mosque on this side. And we can see in this perspective view the Great Pagoda, the mosque, and a corner of Chambers' interpretation of the Alhambra. So this pagoda is 10 stories. It's 163 feet tall with an octagonal floor plan. Um, the roofs are made of varnished iron of different colors. And in this design, you can see it's hung with tiny dragons holding little bells in their mouths that hang off of the corner, 80 dragons. Um, that according to Chambers are covered with a thin glass of various colors which produces a most dazzling reflection. Um, so it's considerably more colorful then than it, than it is now as it stands. So where is he getting the sources for this? The um, most well-known pagoda would have been the porcelain pagoda at Nanjing which is illustrated in Neuhoff's publication and was well-known and imitated in porcelain, as actual porcelain pagodas um, as interior ornamentation. Um, but also let's keep in mind that in addition to the print sources, that since Chambers himself actually went to China, or at least went to Canton, he would have been an eyewitness to the pagodas that stand um, in the Canton Harbor. And these pagodas are featured quite prominently in later painted and printed views of the Canton Riverfront. So the most famous um, pagoda being the uh, Wampoa Pagoda that stood on an island in, at the mouth of the river and would have been um, a, a, a signpost, a, a navigational signpost to the river merchants who are traveling. So let's just quickly look at, so you can see how it kind of commands the landscape of the, of the Canton Harbor. And here we see it again painted, painted much later in the 19th century of um, the pagoda. And in form, it's quite similar to what we see at Kew. So if you're standing at the top of the Kew pagoda, You've enacted the imperial gaze. You command an extensive view on all sides over a rich and variegated country. And so that view from the top is, you're not only seeing the exotic geography of the Alhambra, the mosque, and the pagoda, but you're seeing also into the cityscape of London. You're seeing across the park to um, the palace at the other end. And so this has been called, you know, it's a symbolic possession of Chinese culture, and that expressed through the landscape, um, we've expressed British colonial and commercial power, that at this end, the, the exotic end, we're seeing the, um, the network of trade that is being established from the Mediterranean to the Near East and the Far East. So let's come back to our view. So if we're standing here and looking across the entire garden, we're going to see something like this. 
So we're standing at the lawn here, looking across the lakes. This is the island in the middle of the lake. There is a bridge that goes across the water, and we see in the center the pagoda rising here, and then on either side, a temple of victory that's on a little hill, and then next to the water, the temple of Arethusa. So what is happening here? Um, we have a temple, temple of victory that is celebrating the British victory over the French in 1759, actually. And then on the other side, a temple to a water nymph. The tale of Arethusa is that she was a nymph who was trying to escape the amorous clutches of a river god, and so she was transformed into a spring that flows beneath the sea. And so she's a spring that flows beneath the sea. Now, again, we have this idea of travel, of journeying, that you travel across the water to exotic lands and, bring, and come back victorious. And so if we're looking at the entire plan of the garden together, there is this journey from a British space. So here's the palace again that goes, if you go across the lake or the ocean, the seas, to foreign lands, and then you come back and you bring back the goods that you've brought to be domesticated in the spaces of the menagerie, the aviary, the, the greenhouse, and the orangery. So in the entire landscape of Q, we have the, a visualization of the aspirations of the British Empire. We're going to continue with Mr. Chambers for a little bit because he wasn't done. Uh, he, you know, he had finished Q around the 1760s, but then in 1772, he published another uh, key text in how uh, the Chinese garden is being interpreted in England. This is his dissertation on oriental gardening that he published in two editions. And in the second edition, he, he added an explanatory discourse by Tan Chet Kua uh, of Chuan Zhu Fu, et cetera. Um, because when he, he published the dissertation and then was, was actually widely mocked for it. And so in the second edition, he, he added this um, appendix where he's taken on the voice of a Chinese gentleman to explain himself further. But why was this, uh, yes, if we could all do that with our own dissertations. Hmm. Uh, um, so in this dissertation, he, he returns this idea of the different types of scenes in um, the Chinese garden. And He's developing this idea of the, the pleasing, the terrible, or sometimes called the horrid, and the surprising, or the enchanted. And so for the, the pleasing is uh, pretty straightforward. He's talking about, you know, you have lots of picturesque plants, various waterways, there are architectural features, pavilions that are arranged around a serpentine um, waterway feature with kind of domesticated, um, animals that are brought from exotic places that are kind of gambling about. But then he kind of gets into trouble when he's talking about the terrible and the surprising. With the terrible, he has these very um, vivid descriptions of the wilderness, of going into dark valleys and caves, of coming across ruins and sites of devastation, of hearing jackals and wild beasts and bats cry out in the darkness, um, that you're going to wander around and you're going to see ki lime kilns and fires and smoke, like all of these scenes of like the hells of industry. Um, and then he, you know, he gets to the surprising, and the surprising is full of sudden contrast, really sharp changes in the landscape, that, that in a Chinese garden, you'll be on a, on a cliff with like a very steep waterfall that falls down the edge, and then you're gonna wander into a very deep cavern where it's dark and full of dampness and full of grottos. And so it feels almost like you're traversing, well, a space that we clearly we have not seen in a Chinese garden. Um, <laughs> And so his contemporaries said that he, he had leaped, leaped the, the aspects of truth and common sense. You know, he's indulging in a flight of fancy. Uh, 
And like current day scholars of, of Chambers would say that, well, you know, he's really, he's not really actually talking about China. They argue that he's using China as, a, as just a mouthpiece to criticize his great rival, um, Lancelot Capability Brown, whose landscape designs he didn't like. He thought they were really boring. Um, that Chambers is using the, the Chinese landscape just as a rhetorical device to promote landscape design as an art. Um, and if we're looking at his actual descriptions, yeah, like they don't make sense in the context of a Chinese garden, but they do make sense in the context of the entire geography of China, that if you're crossing the entire landscape, you would go across rickety bridges from, uh, that, that lead you across ravines and caverns that you would hear wild creatures howling. Um, and what's really interesting is that if, you, if you're thinking about his description of smoke and fire, it actually is quite similar to descriptions by Jesuits who visited the porcelain production sites at Jingdezhen, a city that is mountains on one side, a river on another, and all day and night lit glowing red with the fires of the kilns. Um, and so we see actually, if we go back to Q, that he has these features of industry in Kew Gardens. This is his design for the great exotic stove that would have heated up the greenhouse uh, behind it. And he also includes in his published designs a water screw that is situated at the head of the lake that pumps water and keeps water moving through the garden. Um, but when we look at the perspective views of Kew, we can see actually here, the orangery is here, and here's that bridge. This is the House of Confucius in the back, and right behind the House of Confucius would have been that water, that water turning engine. Um, we don't see the signs of industry in the garden as shown here. So what is he thinking, you know, we have to remember that this is a time in England where England is also entering the Industrial Revolution. And he is an architect to the king. He is a landscape designer. He's designing Somerset House at the same, or, you know, later in his career, thinking about the, um, what the Royal Academy is doing, what England is doing as a country. Um, and so perhaps when he's thinking about China as a garden, he's really thinking about how do we use the principles of landscape design to landscape the entire, the entire nation? So the entire nation is a garden where we can incorporate scenes of industry in a way that is naturalized within this landscape in the way that, that China has done. A thought to leave you with, <laughs> even if his contemporaries didn't quite see it that way. Um, and his contemporaries were actually, at that point, they had grown a, a little bit disillusioned with the idea of the Chinese garden. They said that actually these ideas of irregularity and naturalness, they're not from China. These are native English ideas. We're just using China as a rhetorical device. So they wanted to disown um, any connection to China at that point. You know, this is, this is when Lord McCartney's come back from his failed mission in 17. 93, saying that actually, no, the Channel Emperor doesn't really, isn't really interested in trading with us, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, but <laughs> in France, the, the idea of China and the English landscape garden is so closely entwined that they actually call that type of gardening Le Jardin Anglo-Chinois, the English Chinese garden. And our most important source for these chinoiserie gardens um, in, in all of Europe during this time is this publication in the late 18th century by Georges Leroux. And this is a 20 volume set um, that, that is actually at the Getty Research Institute and I've, I flipped through it um, and it's digitized. And it's a great resource because many of the features that it shows are no longer extant. Uh, they're not surviving if you go to these places today. And so it's actually in La Rouge who is first to publish images of the Yuan in print form. And um, although he doesn't identify it as the Yuan Yuan exactly, they're just, they're all part of this volume that's called the, um, let's see, 
the pleasure palaces of the emperor of China. So they come, there's very little description that comes with this. He doesn't specify exactly where they are. Um, but we can just see here, just to show you some examples of what is the types of features that are in um, French gardens. So at the uh, Desert de Retz, we have this Chinese house. And this Chinese house is um, in a landscape that also includes a giant broken column that was the residence of Mazir Monville, where he could um, reside in what looks like a ruin, but it's an artificial ruin, and look over his landscape that includes this Chinese house <laughs> and a, a tartar tent. Um, with these doors with kind of imitation of Chinese characters written on the side that don't actually say anything. Uh, and um, the, the Desert de Retz is, has actually recently been restored by the World Monuments Fund, if you ever do find yourself in France. Um, in the La Rouge publication, we see designs for um, Chinese pagodas and pavilions that are always situated over these strange rockeries, kind of in imitation of the artificial rockeries that were such a strong feature in, in actual Chinese gardens, as well as uh, more fantastical designs that really don't have anything to do with Chinese gardens, but place the idea of China in the landscape, like this balançoire, so you actually have a, a swing, the swing set, um, but in the shape of Chinese figures. <laughs> so, What's also great about this whole print series is that it not only includes the plans and the ground layouts of gardens as they existed at the time, but also included plans for gardens that were designed but never actually built. And so we have a most fantastic one shown here by an Italian designer, Francesco Bettini, who had trained in England, in France. He actually worked with La Rouge for a little bit. So many of the prints in La Rouge's publication were actually drawn by Bettini. But this is Bettini's design for a, um, a grand project for an English, French, Chinese garden of 1784. Um, and it's quite delightful. If you look at it, it's, it's almost as if it has themed areas. So we have a central chateau here. There's a formal Italian-French garden on this side, a English landscape garden that extends here, an entire area of water with a little boat floating on it down on this end, and then a, a Chinese and Japanese garden up in this quadrant. So it's almost like looking at a plan of Disneyland. <laughs> you know, remember I'm from LA? So <laughs> where you have the central area and then you can pivot into all of these different areas. And to enhance this idea of pivoting into different scenic themed areas, each side of the chateau is actually designed with a different facade so that and if we can look a little bit closer here, so here's a close-up of the, that chateau with four different facades, A, B, C, D, the formal garden here, Chinese garden up here, English garden here, and then all this, this water feature down here. Um, and you can see actually each facade is different. So as you're, so the facade tells you which part, which themed area you're going into from a very Italianate design to an English mansion, to a chinoiserie pavilion, to this kind of rustic looking hamlet set over a, a grotto and rockery. Um, here is a, a detail of the uh, Chinese garden, of course, with the obligatory pagoda, the arched bridges, serpentining water features, water features that are subdivided by the islets and bridges into multiple parts. Um, and he includes also a description that is not pictured because it's going to be underground. This is a, a description of a crystal sea palace that he actually lifts out of William Chambers' uh, description of the enchanted. So in, in French, 
on the plan he has written, the Chinese make haita in their gardens or houses underwater. They are salons, cabinets, the, these walls are encrusted with shells, branches of coral, marine plants. The lower divinities of the humid element are placed in niches. There are compartments of jasper, agate, mother of pearl. Um, mother of pearl forms the floor and the ceiling is composed of glass and ice, which admits light through the water, which runs through it. And so this description just continues of, a, of an underwater crystal palace where you can see the fish swimming above you. Um, this was never built. <laughs> uh, but the idea of China as a fantastic place, as a place of enormous material wealth that would dazzle all of your senses is clearly present. Um, and it's that engagement with all of your senses so that you're like never bored. So everywhere you turn, everywhere you look, there's something to surprise you, to engage you. That's what William Chambers was really trying to push, you know, because what he didn't want the landscape garden to become is that he didn't want it to look like what Capability Brown was doing, which, and this is a photograph of Blenheim as it currently stands after it's been landscaped um, by Capability Brown, where, and Chambers, he doesn't actually name Capability Brown in his dissertation on oriental gardening, but it's clear that's who he was thinking of, because he said that, you know, after they've, they've gone through this process, our gardens differ very little from fields. There's nothing to delight or amuse you within them. Um, so that's what he was really trying to do with the, the dissertation on oriental gardening. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, by the 19th century, the, the Western enchantment with Chinese gardens had started to fade. The relationship between China and the West was changing. China was no longer being seen as a place um, to where their values were to be imitated or emulated. Um, it was starting to be seen as stagnant and uh, tyrannical. Um, and this culminates with the looting of the Yuan Ming Yuan, where in 1860, the English and the French have marched upon Beijing. They come across the, the Yuan Ming Yuan and they occupy it. By this point, the, the Xianfeng Emperor had already fled, had left the garden um, and had fled north. So it was largely abandoned. And the, um, the English say the French started it, um, started to, to loot the palace and carry many of those objects. Many of those objects ended up back in, in France and England. Um, so we have a scene of revelry and looting and complete disenchantment then when Elgin, Lord Elgin, who is the son of the other Lord Elgin who took the Parthenon marbles, when younger Lord Elgin then orders his soldiers to set fire to the entire complex. And so now we have the Chinese garden, the emperor's Chinese garden entirely um, put to flame and it continued to fall into disrepair for many more decades to come so that if you go today, that same hall of calm seas looks like this. So I want to in the last kind of few minutes we have um, to turn from the, the idea of the Chinese garden as expressed in the, in the landscape to actually to the interior. Because in the wonderful examples of surviving wallpaper, we actually see many uh, images of Chinese gardens as they were thought of. Um, so this is at Saltram in Devon, where in the study, there's a whole set of about, I think, 60 plus prints that have been cut and rearranged and placed symmetrically over the fireplace so that they're, so they're, they're matching um, pairs. So this is the same as this one and this one's the same as this one. Um, so it's a, yes, let's see. Yeah, in the study, in the family sitting room, where Im there are images of beautiful ladies and military officials and perspectival outdoor Scenes. So the idea of, a, of outdoor Chinese spaces that are brought into the English interior. 
Um, and then in another room at Saltram, in the Chinese dressing room, this is actually a, a complete collage. So all of these figures are cut out individually and then reassembled and pasted together to form this wallpaper. You can kind of see where the joins are. Um, but then in other, yeah. Um, so that it's an entirely this, this pastiched collage, probably hung by a professional wallpaper hanger. Um, and this is sort of the type of, another form of image of what your elite um, English aristocrat would have perceived as what is happening in a Chinese garden, that it's a space where there are interesting openings that lead your eye to other places, and it's filled with beautiful ladies and warriors who are um, frolicking about. Uh, and so, and there are, um, yeah, native precedents for this. So we have a Suzhou print that's depicting a story of the Western Chamber where um, each, where we can kind of see into the interior of this space and each scene is enacted out within this, um, this space of the, of the house and the garden, as well as um, the prints are also very similar to paintings of beautiful women that are done around the same time, um, again, like arrayed against a moon opening and um, so this idea that the the garden is a, is a feminine space, um, a space for romance and an intrigue as well. So that's one type of how the Chinese garden makes its way into the interior. We have another form of wallpaper, the landscape type. So this is the uh, east bedroom at Harwood House in Leeds. Wallpaper hung by Thomas Chippendale in 1769, and it's of a landscape type. So if we look closely at the details, we can see that they're actually scenes of production, of tea picking, and of porcelain making. So very much uh, a, a way of depicting the Chinese landscape that is derived from the images of tilling and weaving that was commissioned by the Kangxi Emperor. These scenes of production and agricultural richness and peace within the realm. Um, these images of the Chinese landscape are also quite popular in the 19th century as well with these pith paper, with um, painted albums of production, where here we're seeing tea production, uh, and let's see, tea, sewing tea, and then picking and drying the tea, as well as scenes of porcelain production, um, which is all, all of these scenes of industry being set outside in a quite pastoralized landscape where you're not seeing the hardship of producing these objects. There's not, there actually is very, very little smoke and sweat and labor. It's all um, quite picturesque and cleaned up, and the kilns are set in a space where there's a, a moon door with pleasant streams that flow nearby and so on. Um, and then finally, the last type of wallpaper is the bird and tree type. This is at Igam Moat in Kent. It's hand printed and painted. Let's look at a detail where um, we're seeing silver pheasants and golden pheasants, cranes, amidst this landscape of strange rocks, as well as uh, a diversity of flowering trees, magnolia, peonies, plums, I think some orchids around here somewhere. Um, so this idea of what is part of the natural world, the natural landscape of China brought into the interior. Here's a later example from the 19th century at Penryn Castle in Wales, and you can really see in this restored section how brilliant the color of these would have been with a pair of mandarin of ducks in a landscape of bamboo and flowers um, another, in another room at Penryn. Um, and so the, 
the artists in Canton that are making this wallpaper, they're the same ones who are also um, painting images of the natural world to be taken home as souvenir booklets. So this is blown up really big, but it's only about this large uh, in the collection at the San Diego Museum of Art, an entire album of butterflies and birds. And I'm just gonna show you a few of them because they're so beautiful and they really get across um, this idea of how full of variety uh, China could be botanically and, in, and also in terms of the fauna. So here is another one. And it's really brilliant. And pith paper is a bit translucent. So they, the images, the colors really glow when you're looking at them. So butterflies and flowers as well as birds and flowers of these little pheasant creatures and this. Um, if you want to see examples of Chinese wallpaper in the US, then you should go to Winter Tour in Delaware, where uh, Henry Francis DuPont has had installed um, bird and flower wallpaper in the entrance hall. And it's, I quite like it here, because as we saw in the other examples, the wallpaper in the previous examples were all in more private spaces, in dressing rooms, in bedrooms. Here, in this American estate, it's um, in a public space, in the entrance hall. It links, when you come in, it links the building's entrance to actually the garden in the back. So it, again, we have the, the Chinese landscape acting as a, as a mediator. Um, and then most spectacularly, in the Chinese parlor, entirely hung with 18th century wallpaper. This would have been put in in the 1930s. Um, but the wallpaper is 18th century of scenes of leisure in the garden. And it fits in quite well with the space because then if you are, so this is the edge of one of the couches. So if you're sitting here at the edge of a couch, sipping some champagne with your great Gatsby friends, uh, <laughs> you are part of this entire scene of conviviality um, with the Chinese figures in the back, or perhaps they're part of this scene with you, so that architecturally, the, the image, the wallpaper, and the entire space are working together. Um, so I think, let's see, what time is it? 12.05, okay. Um, we've been thinking about this relationship between China and the West, and how the garden is expressive of, of the relationship, and how that relationship changes. So I wanna show you a garden in the US, in Bar Harbor. This is the Abby Aldrich Rockefeller Garden um, that is also sometimes called the, um, the Chinese Garden of, of Abby Rockefeller. And it was designed by Beatrix Jones Ferrand, one of the first American landscape architects. And she's actually the first woman founding member of the American Society for Landscape Architecture. So, and she worked for the um, American elite of the day. Uh, her first so-called Chinese garden is this one she designed for Mr. Willard Strait, who was a diplomat uh, to China from the US in the early 20th century. So we're seeing this changing relationship um, where China like, has now um, been opened up to trade and diplomacy and you have American men uh, with their families going there and then coming back and wanting to bring back into their estates the uh, symbols of, of their careers. And so we have here a formal laid out garden, but then behind it, red latticework Chinese pavilions with um, a pool here and then with little like plaster Buddhist figures that would have arrayed on both sides of the garden. Um, so that was Franz, one of Franz's earlier works, but she also was commissioned by Abby Rockefeller who had been actually personally been in Asia in 1921 with her husband when they opened up Peking, uh, Peking Union Medical College and she began collecting um, the arts of Asia from China, Japan, Korean, and arrayed them in her, um, in their spaces. So this is here in Bar Harbor, Maine. So we're gonna take a stroll through her garden. Um, we're gonna begin here with a south gate 
and stone sculptures from Korea of rams. We're gonna walk, we're gonna walk through this gate and come to this spirit path that's lined by Korean tomb figures of civil and military officials. Um, here's a planning photograph uh, from, from the archives. And so this is the path going down through here. We're actually gonna stop around here because, okay, yeah, so <laughs> this is based off of her travels. So again, think, you know, designing her garden as a souvenir of, of travels um, where she had gone to the Ming tombs and recalled seeing these sculptures arrayed around and so in conversation with Beatrix Ferrand, recreating that but with Korean sculptural figures. Um, we're gonna pivot here and walk through this bottle gate. So we can see here this engagement with Chinese gardening forms, right? That we have a shaped doorway that frames the view that leads you from an area of um, of darkness and shadow under the trees of the spirit path into a highly contrasted area of bright sunshine. So we're gonna walk through here and then look across the space of a flower garden where right on the other end of an axis is the design of a moon gate. And as you walk right through the moon gate, there's a seated sculpture of the Shakyamuni Buddha to greet you on the other side. And Buddhist sculpture is all over this garden. I mean, this garden really is, it's not trying to be a authentic recreation of a Chinese garden, it's really a pastiche, a creative pastiche of Abby Rockefeller and Beatrix Ferrand finding a way to create something new out of their collection of Buddhist sculptures, um, of of um, actual sculptures that were collected along with Beatrix designs that are based off of um, photographs and drawings that she had seen of Chinese garden and architecture. So we also have actual fragments from um, the roofs of Beijing when much of Beijing was being redesigned to accommodate modern transportation like trains and so many of its walls and buildings were being dismantled and the Rockefellers just bought up a lot of that tile to be incorporated into, into their garden. So we, we're seeing this movement from chinoiserie to um, re creative rearranging of authentic fragments and then finally in the late 20th century um, with the opening of China in the 1980s to, um, to the to the rest of the world, then we get into the realm of uh, authentic recreation. So many of you are going to be familiar with this at the Met, the recreation of the Astor Court uh, in the 1980s that is actually a, um, a copy of a small courtyard garden inside the master of the fishing nets garden in Suzhou. So this Again, we have this, this very familiar to us now moon gate that frames a view into a different frame, a rectangular frame, that teases you as to what might be on the other side. And it's not until you walk through that the entire area opens up to this entire courtyard. Um, and this is looking at it back from the other end, so the importation of actual lake tie rockeries, the pavilion, um, a zigzagging walkway. Uh, and this is done with the cooperation of garden designers and master craftsmen from Suzhou, actually. So again, this changing relationship, right? That this is at a point when, the, when Wen Fang, the curator of East Asian art, can actually personally go visit the PRC and meet with architectural historians and visit the gardens of Suzhou there. Um, that they can coordinate with master craftsmen in the Suzhou Gardens administration to use authentic materials um, to recreate the space and to have all of those authentic materials then like shipped to New York to be reassembled um, by workers in New York. And so, so this is the pavilion in the Astor Court. This is the pavilion in the master of the fishing nets garden. And then, of course, then um, the use of the hall at the other end to display, as a display space, to display Ming furniture. 
Um, I think we're running out of time, so I just want to leave you with um, our last kind of Chinese garden, which is the Huntington's Garden of Flowing Fragrance, which is an entire past, not, so the Astor Court was a copy of an ex pre-existing space. The Huntington's Garden is a true pastiche, also done in cooperation with the Suzhou Gardens Landscape Administration to create a Chinese garden, but in the landscape of Southern California. Um, so we don't have time to do a full walkthrough of this. I'll just show you some of the slides in case it piques some questions in your mind. Um, and these are all of the spaces are named. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, do we have time? Okay. Um, okay, we'll go back. All right, fine. It's too good to, to skip, right? So. Yeah, so we're gonna come into the main entrance after walking past this undulating wall that's called the Wall of Colorful Clouds. We're going to enter into the first court where you don't actually see very much of the garden from here, but you're teased by the idea that another world lies beyond. Here it is from another, from another angle. Um, we're gonna walk along the side. You're gonna hear and see a waterfall that cascades down, and if you follow the line of that water, you're gonna see a pavilion way at the other end, and if you continue to follow that, it's actually the Japanese garden that's on the other side. Uh, and, okay, another example of framing through creative shapes. Um, we'll come around here to the plantain court with tea shops and a tea room on either end. We're gonna stand at the terrace and look across the way. I think some of the trees need a little bit of trimming here because in the past when I've gone here, you can actually see the San Gabriel Mountains behind. So another key feature of Chinese gardens of borrowing something, borrowing a scene that's not actually in your garden but on the other side, but you bring it into conversation um, with your garden. Uh, and we're gonna come around here to the zigzagging walkway, the corridor of water and clouds, um, come to this pavilion at the end that is very evocatively titled the Terrace of the Jade Mirror, so that as you stand and look at it through one end, your view is actually blocked by this tree that's placed here, but you can see an enormous Lake Tai Rock on the other side. Um, and we'll come to the, and there are many different types of bridges here with the zigzagging joy of fish bridge where you can have a very Taoist moment and wonder to yourself about how you really know if the fish are happy. <laughs> <laughs> and then look across at the jade ribbon bridge, which when the water level is just right, the reflection completes the circle. Um, and then as you come all the way around the garden, we have a stone, a stone boat viewing platform and this fantastic, enormous, enormous rock that looks like it should, that's really defying gravity. Um, that's called the, the rock of patching up the sky, referencing an old legend where the, the goddess had to patch a hole in the sky with the rocks. Um, so in final conclusion, remember how we, we began this with the Lion Grove Garden that had been purchased by I.M. Pei's grand uncle. Well, that garden was um, donated to the government in the 50s, <laughs> uh, but, and, and has not been returned to the Pei family, but I.M. Pei was invited to come back to Suzhou so that he could design the architecture for the Suzhou Museum. And you can see here's the Suzhou Museum. It's right next to the Lion Grove Garden here and is also right next to the other famous Suzhou Garden, the Humble Administrator Garden. So finally, we have a Chinese-American architect who spent his summers in the Lion Grove Garden, made his career in the US and internationally, has now been invited to come back to, in, this, in our last example of cross-cultural translation, to create a museum. So 
and he incorporates many of the principles we've been discussing, but also blends those with modern architectural design. So we have very, very clean geometric lines, but we also have a moon door that slides open when you come in. And the first thing you see as you walk into this museum oops, is the garden that's in the central courtyard. But you can't walk directly into this garden from this space. You can't progress in that straight line. You have to go around. So as you go around the building, you keep catching glimpses of that garden through the framed windows. Um, and you know, you'll probably go into an exhibit on the side and then you're gonna come back and then catch a glimpse of the garden again. So your interest is continually piqued. And in the exhibition halls, I quite like this juxtaposition where you have a beautiful Song Celadon bowl and it's placed so it's centered right against the window of, bam of a bamboo grove beyond. So the colors really work together really well of green upon green, of porcelain against the nat of, against a plant, against bamboo. Um, we'll come into a tea court where there's a, they found a very, a, like a, a very old wisteria vine that they then grafted onto new wisteria so that um, you have this beautiful wisteria um, that grows along the, the, the lattice work of the tea room. Um, and as you're making your way through the museum space, you're constantly confronted by contrast between light and dark, where, and light and shadow as well. So you get these um, very strict geometric, the strict geometric precision um, within the space while you're catching glimpses of the garden right beyond. So you actually, when you come outside, then we have a modernist reinterpretation of a pavilion set in the water where you can relax and watch the fishes um, and um, look upon this I.M. Pei's interpretation of rockery in a garden. So these are not the filled with holes and looking like lions and clouds like tie rocks, but his interpretation of how to um, bring the conversation about Chinese gardens into the 21st century. And so what he's actually doing now is looking at a painting of landscape and looking and seeing how it's these layers and layers of silhouetted mountains that he then has cut into these flattened out silhouetted rocks and placed against the white wall. Um, and he actually um, asked the craftsmen to use a blowtorch on the very tops of the rocks to blacken them further so you get this contrast, as the, ro the rocks are lighter on the bottom, they get darker on the top, and then they're set against this white wall that is like a perfect expanse of cloud and mist. So with that, I will end this talk.